Dr. Howard Lux is with me. We're going to talk about some important matters of muscle mass, longevity, and into your world as an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist. But uh, your article captivated me because it was going way beyond what we we usually get from from a doc talking about uh, your knee surgeries and whatever else is going on. I'm wondering if you've been inspired to uh, pursue this track from getting tired of cutting people up who you know didn't have sufficient muscle mass to begin with and suffered orthopedic injuries. Yeah, great question. So honestly, I came to this approach uh, of lifespan improvement, health span, and longevity selfishly, right? I want to live longer. Uh, I'm a trail runner. I'm an endurance runner. I used to be a triathlete when I had a good shoulder. Uh, and I just want to be able to do this forever. So I just started diving in deeper and deeper and writing about it. Uh, and I tend to just write to improve my understanding. Um, and luckily with my training, I'm able to come at this as uh, through an evidence-based ba ba manner. Um, <clears throat> I've always prided myself on being able to drill down on things and present them, hopefully in a way that's easy to digest. Um, now, to the contrary, or I also have found in uh, the last five years or so, <clears throat> it helps a lot of my patients in terms of how I uh, approach their issues. I don't treat images, I treat people. So I'm not treating your MRI finding, I'm treating you, because I may have a marathoner in front of me, I may have a couch potato, I may have someone who has no muscle mass and is not gonna recover well from an operation. I may have someone who's had three operations and they're looking at me to do their fourth and they haven't given it time to recover. I'm looking at people who don't understand how long it takes to recover from injuries and how important our metabolic health is to our overall health, not just our heart, our brain, but our knees, shoulders, tendons, and muscles too. So I came at this for my own selfish reasons, and I do stutter on, t on occasion, so forgive me. Um, but uh, I'm now I'm here to share it uh, for as many years as I have left. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we're talking about this uh, disturbing condition of sarcopenia, the age-related loss of muscle mass, how common it is, how uh, normal it seems. When I look around, we all sort to be in this, this idea of accepting that we're just going to decline and stoop over and, um, you know, <laughs> change our height on our driver's license as we age and that it's uh, virtually inevitable and anyone over whatever pick an age, 50, 60, is relegated to uh, watching the NFL on TV and, and reminiscing about the days when uh, you could go out for a pass too. Uh, but it seems like there's a lot of um, support for even people in the advanced age groups being able to build muscle and make incredible strength gains. Listen, an 85 year old will gain new muscle pro protein mass with one workout. So you're never too old to work out. Um, and it tires me when I call trainers or therapists who are even working with my parents and they say, oh, they can't do this. I'm like, yes, they can. I know 80 year olds who can squat 150 pounds. You know, there's no reason to stop them from doing this. You know, it's amazing that the human capacity to normalize tragedy or mm. new behaviors or new issues is unprecedented, right? I mean, We've normalized the loss of 1,800, 2,000, 2,500 pe people a day to a virus. So we can normalize anything. We don't realize that we're tripping on things. We don't realize it's hard to go up and down stairs. We don't realize that we can't lift certain things that we used to. We want to go put a few pounds, a few uh, bags of mulch in the yard. We have to ask our children to carry it for us. That shouldn't be. Um, we should be able to do these things, but you're right. S sarcopenia is an awful process. It's an age-related, pre-programmed, genetically-based loss of muscle power and muscle mass. Um, and starting at the age of you know, 38 to 40, we lose about 1% of our muscle mass per year. And that accelerates as we get into our mid to late 50s. Uh, and the loss of mass has extraordinary consequences uh, in regards to our health and longevity. 
and our ability to propel ourselves along this earth for as long as we want to. So it's a very important topic. Uh, and it, the earlier that we pay attention to it, the better that we're gonna be. So losing 1% per year is a pretty disturbing accelerated rate. Now, if we decide to take a stand on the matter and do something about it, starting at 38, which is kind of scary, um, you know, I don't think a lot of 38 year olds are thinking about how their muscle mass is going to decline. But um, let's say we we try to um, stave that off. How can those statistics change? Yeah. So luckily, we can treat sarcopenia. We can minimize its effects. We can minimize its prevalence uh, and we can minimize the effects all the way into our 70s and 80s. It's never too late to start exercising. If we participate in a resistance exercise program beginning in our 30s, 40s, or 50s, we will mitigate the, the sarcopenia changes that have taken place already and prevent further changes. So this is a preventable process. Yeah, I, I think you could uh, argue that if you're doing something much better than you did a decade ago or two decades ago, you can be, um, by all accounts, a stronger and arguably younger on many levels, despite your chronological age. No doubt. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in the best shape of my life um, from both a resistance and strength perspective and an endurance per perspective. That's from training better, training smarter, uh, focusing on the right strengthening exercises, not overdoing one. Um, uh. It's all about lo load management for me. Um, and, you know, I can compete, not compete, <laughs> finish races and events easier than I did 10 years ago. I don't compete because I don't care if you finish be before me. I just <laughs> care that I finish. <laughs> well, if you're doing long stuff, I think that's the main goal for most people. You better not be that, out there competing at mile 12 of a, of a 50K ultra marathon. Absolutely. But I got to admit that when I'm when I'm coming up at the end of a long race, a lot of vertical, uh, it's really great to see some young people dying in front of me and running right by them. It, no better feeling. So, <laughs> so I'm curious about your endurance passion. Um, it, the listeners know, and you may know, I, I was a professional triathlete way back in the day when I was a young person. And I contend that the, the level that I trained and performed at had a lot of adverse consequences to my uh, desire to uh, delay aging. I, I believe it accelerated my aging process from the age of 20 to 30. Uh, my muscle mass and my muscle strength was not very impressive. I was highly adapted to swim in a straight line pretty fast, bicycle on a straight line pretty fast, and then get off and run pretty fast. But when the smoke cleared and I actually retired at the tender age of 30 from the pro circuit, and then I'm looking at uh, this this highway uh, representing the rest of my life, and I realized that I was, you know, pathetic on so many scoreboard uh, check marks for uh, comprehensive functional fitness and longevity factors. And that's when I embarked on becoming competent in a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but if you're pursuing these endurance goals at your age, and you're going to tell us your age because you're in the best shape of your life, that's super inspiring. Um, how do those go? How do they complement each other, knowing that the endurance training or the, the goals you're doing for long distance uh, endurance are in many ways uh, potentially compromising your, your muscle development and maintenance? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I, I don't do super long events. You know, I'm never going to complete a 100 mile race. I'm probably never going to do a 50 mile. Um, but for me, these endurance races are, you know, 20 miles, but have 8,000 vertical feet, 5,000 mm. vertical feet. So you're going up and down these Northeast mountains. Uh, and it's, it's quite an accomplishment to do that. Um, but you're absolutely right. Training for an endurance, uh, a true endurance race, 50, 100 miles, it's not something you do if you want to live longer. It's something that you want to do because you want to prove something to yourself. Uh, you can do it once, you can do it twice. If you do it way too often, uh, you are compromising you know, your cardiac health and your longevity. Um, I've seen a lot of endurance athletes suffer because of this in their 40s and 50s with atrial fibrillation, 
heart failure, cardiomyopathy, on and on and on. You're absolutely correct. And also, you know, you're at very high risk when you're performing at that level of overtraining. And overtraining can be such a horrible problem to overcome. So it's it, 20 miles is still a long way. You still have to prepare optimally. I'm thinking that there is some uh, crossover benefit where if you're competent at uh, weighting up a heavy bar and doing squats and doing deadlifts, that's going to transfer over nicely to your running goals, provided you're uh, keeping everything in proper balance. And how do you strike that balance where you can still get out there and do the preparatory runs of several hours, but you're also keeping this, this muscle mass and this competency in the gym? Yeah, great, great question. So in, my, in the off season, in the winter, uh, I'm concentrating on base training. So I'm running zone two, heart rates of 120, 125, et cetera. Um, so that's 930, 945 pace, you know, easy, simple miles. Um, and they, yeah, that's, that's a load that I can handle for, for a good distance. I do two days of resistance training during this time of the year. Um, most of it legs, uh, some arms, but I don't care what my arms look like. I just do it to maintain overall strength. Uh, but from a metabolic perspective, with everything, the uh, larger muscles that are well-functioning, for all the benefits that they provide to us, you want to concentrate on the largest muscle groups, not hmm. your legs. Um, and for me, as a trail runner, I want to concentrate on my legs because I want to go up and down those hills um, strong uh, and in a protective manner. And so I do focus on uh, squats. I focus on deadlifts. I do a lot of single leg work. Um, in the winter, I do a lot of plyometric work, um, as especially in January, February. And then starting in the spring, when I start to run more events and I'm outside more, I'll cut this down to one day of resistance training a week. Uh, I still struggle with um, this balance of two disparate fitness objectives where I'm going out and, and doing my deadlifts and having a great workout in the gym. And then I'm sore for three days and it's affecting my, I'm not doing endurance running, but I'm doing sprinting and jumping and things that require freshness. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you have any insights about that, where um, you, you got to go out there and have a nice trail run and climb the hill strong. And if you're recovering from your previous squat session, that's going to be tough. Sure. So uh, Stuart Phillips, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, and many others have, demonstrated that in order to build strength uh, and even muscle mass, so girth, if you're interested, um, doesn't have to be overly taxing, right? We can be working out at 50 to 60% of our one rep max, eight to 12 reps. So that last one is difficult, but not exhausting. And you're done. And you're, that is working. That is allowing me to accomplish my goals, not, uh, exceed my uh, load capacity. So it's not going to set me back the next day. Um, my longest run of the week is Sunday. Uh, so my second resist, resist training day is Thursday. So uh, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a run on Thursday morning. I'm doing that workout on Thursday night. Uh, Friday is a very short run. Saturday is a shorter run, five-ish miles. Um, and so Sunday will be that long run, and then Monday's a, a day of rest. Uh, and you cite research. There's a lot of emerging research now that this, uh, this critical objective of building and maintaining muscle mass throughout life doesn't really require that much time. It's when within sure. reach of everyone. I think your article, you said an hour a week is plenty total toward your goal of uh, getting strong and, and doing the workouts. I know people are even uh, touting protocols that require much less than that. Dr. Doug McGuff's right. book, Body by Science, my recent podcast guest, uh, the subtitle is 12 minutes a week of your right. strength training and you'll have this incredible uh, benefit to gaining muscle strength. And in fact, if you try to uh, tiptoe beyond the optimal uh, minimal frequency, that's when you can invite some problems such as the soreness and the fatigue that I'm uh, referencing. Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, we have seven minute workouts, three minute workouts, 30 minute workouts. I get it. You know, 
we're going to have people that are pushing the extremes here on both sides. Um, it, you don't need that much to maintain your muscle mass uh, and to 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 delay the issues associated with sarcopenia and to provide yourself the benefits if you are training for a certain event, cycling, running, trails, hills, etc. cetera. Um, I've gotten to the point where I've balanced my loads, you know, training peaks, whatever that you're going to use to monitor your load management, um, <clears throat> that I'm dialed in. So I'm not sore at, at after a workout unless I'm stupid and I throw in some, something new. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'm sore for three or four days and it's awful. Um, and I won't do that again. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it boils down to load management. It boils down to knowing what you're, ca what you're capable of doing, um, what you should be doing and what you need to do. And I don't exceed what I need to do because my goal is not to get bigger. Uh, my goal is not to necessarily get you know, stronger. I don't, I'm not gonna be a beast at 58. Um, and so I want to be able to run. That's what I'm optimizing for. So I optimize for longevity and my running. So someone you know, optimizing for longevity and heading into the gym and deciding uh, the specific nature of their workout, do we need to push it toward a complete failure of the muscle on a single set like many people are advocating? I'm thinking of McGuff's Big Five workout. I'm thinking of John Jaquish's X3 bar where you're directed right. to continue to stretch the resistance band until you're completely out of energy. Right. My mom's yeah. joined the OsteoStrong facility uh, that Jaquish uh, started and, and partnered with Tony Robbins and they do a single set to failure of four major compound movements. And um, you know it's very, very short in duration, but you are asked to exhaust the muscle. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's hard to define absolute failure, right? For me, it's when, you're, when your technique is changing, not mm. when I'm falling on the floor, right? I, you know, if I have to push my right leg harder to get my left leg going to get that last squat up, I'm past failure. Um, and you're going to hurt yourself. That last one needs to be challenging. Do I need to be pushing and grunting and screaming? No. Uh, that's not what I'm in this for. And, you know, there's a lot of research to support that. I mean, as you know, we can look at research and interpret it and find a study to qualify any of our objectives. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my way's right. Look here. Notice this research. Yeah. hundred percent correct. So yeah. I'm not throwing it out there that I'm the only correct one. No. Uh, I'm giving pe people a way to maintain an active lifestyle, to excel at aging and longevity and running and weight training without putting yourself at risk of an overuse injury or of a tendon tear or anything else. I, I don't need to push it that far. I love it, especially uh, being deeply immersed in this diet and fitness scene for so many years, decades. And then you kind of take a breath once in a while and notice uh, real life and real people uh, wandering around in your orbit. And to me, like anyone who's parked their car and walking into the front door of the health club and getting their little tag scanned at the front desk and heading off to a workout, wherever they go, whatever hall they choose, whatever machine they're working on, they have just done themselves an incredible solid that's you know far beyond the people that haven't shown up in the parking lot. And it's almost not even worth splitting the hairs to say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, you're doing that wrong. This, this exercise is better uh, because if they're going in there and sweating and, and you know, getting, some, getting some calories burned in the big picture, that's a huge benefit. But a lot of our listeners, a lot of people out there who are wanting to optimize, I think, you know, number one, we have to avoid that overtaxing of the body. And so if you're coming out of the door, you go in, that's great. If you're coming out with a thumbs up and a smile, that's also uh, allowed you to rise up, you know, in the, uh, in, in the category of, of doing something great uh, instead of, you know, frying yourself from going there too frequently and pushing too hard. Absolutely. 
showing up is the hardest thing. You know, we get lost in the weeds. We get stuck in our bubbles on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever it is. Uh, and we lose the big picture. You know, if we're exercising, working out and running, we're part of a very small minority of people. <laughs> most people are not doing this so showing up is half the issue um you know I, I don't sweat the details it's funny you know you look at you look in the gym uh the parking lot and people are circling around to get the closest spot to the front door i mean what's up with that right <laughs> you're there to work out go park in the farthest spot along you know and get some extra steps in it um so you're hundred percent correct. Just showing up, you're in the top five, eight, nine percent of people. Um, don't kill yourself because you want to be able to come back uh, in a day or two. You, you don't want to have to sit home, call me, uh, come to my office, uh, etc. <laughs> get an exam. You want to avoid that. <laughs> Love it. Okay, man, I'm I'm working on that myself because I get so excited when I'm out there at, at the high jump facility practicing, practicing, and you, you feel great at the time. The inflammation processes have, have kicked in so that your muscles are warm and and loose, and then you, you notice 24 or 36 hours later, oh gosh, maybe I I, I did too much there and and set up, set myself back a bit. So uh, I like that message of just going in there and getting some work done, putting your muscles under the resistance load. Um, one thing you mentioned, and if you're going to try something, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you're going to try something new, right. If you're doing squats and deadlifts, your buddy says, do some uh -huh. side to side stuff, some side lunges, do three with a uh -huh. five pound, with a five pound kettlebell and go home. Don't do 20. Don't go to exhaustion. Cause you're not going to move for five days, you know, build that up slowly, you know, oh, gosh. A, yeah. Uh, especially, so um, the mini bands, which are some very good trainers I know at the elite level, working with Olympic athletes, they call that the single most beneficial. And you know what I'm talking about listeners, the mini yes. band is the thing you can fit in your pocket or in your backpack for traveling and you strap it around your ankles and do the work that isolates the glutes. Uh, but I was so afraid of those for years because anytime I'd bust them out, of course, I'd have to do a heroic workout. And then the next day, uh, my glutes were so tight. I, it was, you know, I, I couldn't walk right for four days. And so finally, I said, you know what, these are important. And I'm going to baby them into my morning routine to where I'm not going to get ridiculously sore the next day. And now I can do an impressive set every single day because they're, they've made the cut, they're in the mix. And so yeah, getting over that threshold where the workout is sensible to whatever level you're at, and then you can build, build, build from there, I think is, is the way to go. Exactly. Anything that's new to your routine, a new direction, a new exercise, just start slow and be smart. Uh, and in two, three weeks, you can do as many as you want. Uh, but we have to avoid downtime. Uh, mm. I don't know how old, how old you are, but at my age, you know, two weeks off will take, take me six, to eight weeks to get back. Oh, wow. Um, right. And, you know, um, if, if you're, if you're running, um, you take a few weeks off, you watch your heart rate. When you go back out to run, it's elevated. It's going to take you time uh, okay. to get back to your time and distance. You take I guess two that's, yeah. or three weeks off from weight training and you're going to be sore the first time you start doing it. That's at an, least at a, my yeah, age. Yeah. An age related concession. Um, I'll accept that. I'm in the same, we're in the same club. I'm in the, uh, the 56 category and uh, <laughs> looking forward to, you know, racing in the 55, 59 division. There's always good news. You can compete with your peers. It's great. Um, but yeah, same with making a mistake. I feel like at my age, I'm mentioning those, you know, overdoing it with a certain workout and I'm sore for four days in comparison to the young folks where they can, you know, go and blast themselves and do something crazy and they're super sore for one or two days. And then, you know, then they're off and running. I remember my son in middle school, um, he, he pulled a hamstring. It was a severe injury, he collapsed on the soccer field and had right. to, you know, had to get helped off and missed the rest of the game. And we went home and iced it. We made an appointment to the, to see the chiropractor. And, and, and you know, this whole thing was so, dis I was so distraught because he was going to miss his important little soccer season. And then like three days later, he's in a track meet. He says, yeah, I can run. I feel fine. 
And I'm like, well, are you sure? How's your leg? And, and he forgot which hamstring that he pulled. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I guess you're okay then if you, if you, uh, if they both feel the same. And it was just such a stark contrast to, you know, stuff that happens to me. And I'm four months later, I'm still you know, testing that hamstring out. Absolutely. Especially as a runner, right? Most of these injuries are training errors. We, mm. we hear it ourselves, you know, and if you get proximal hamstring tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, patella tendons, these things can be eight, 10, 12 month it, it issues. So you, you don't want that. You want to train smart. Uh, one thing you said in, in the article was that the calf muscles are particularly vulnerable or sensitive to this sarcopenia and that we really want to pay close attention to those when we're, we're attempting to build up muscle mass. Why, why are the calf muscles uh, isolated there? Yeah. So it's the more, it's the more distal muscles. Uh, so it'll be your forearms and hand. You know, you see people with a lot of atrophy in their hand. You could see the metacarpals and the bone structure. Um, you can't open bottles as easily as you used to, you should be able to, you know, do a farmer's carry every now and then, you know, work those grip muscles out. Um, and so the, your calf is also a distal muscle, it's lower in the extremity. So it's most sensitive to the sarcopenic process. Uh, and as we lose calf strength, we also start to lose more balance. Um, we start to trip more, stumble more, and thus we're at higher risk of an injury. So I do prioritize calves uh, a lot, a lot of seated calf raise uh, because um, it's not the gastrox that's the stronger calf muscle, it's the soleus. And the soleus is much more powerful. So seated calf raises are critical if you're a runner, if you're a cyclist, and as you're getting older. Uh, the gas rock people, that's the one that's shaped like a rock up high, at least if right. you have good muscle definition, that's how I always remember. And the soleus <laughs> is the one that extends on either side of the leg and uh, attaching into the Achilles tendon. So when you're seated doing rising up onto your tippy toes, underweight or, or even not underweight, that's uh, a, a good exercise for the soleus. So um, I've been trying to integrate those further because I'm curious about you know, the foot pain is one of the major complaints of the population along with back pain. And I'm wondering if the foot pain and the, the plantar fasciitis that I've suffered for so many years on and off, um, is that associated with poor calf function? You know, it's possible. I think it's poor intrinsic muscle strength in the foot, right? Our foot is anatomically very similar to our hand. Um, and do something, you know, do something simple. Take your hand, you know, you can make, you can close it and make a fist. Now just put some pressure across your fingers here to hold them together. Now try and make a fist. Squeeze that, squeeze that, those fingers together and try and make a fist. You can't, mm. right? Yet we are slamming our feet into shoes that are far too narrow, sneakers that are too narrow. Um, and uh, we're throwing off the normal uh, mechanics of our feet. Um, and we're forcing them to accommodate to our shoe wear as opposed to um, just allowing them to accommodate to, to our environment. Uh, so I tell people, get out of the shoes as often as possible. Mm. You know, I, I do one or two runs a week in a minimalist shoe, not the fingers, not the, two, not the five fingers. I use zeros. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, I just love them, but I can't go too far in them because uh, I still get some pain. But uh, mm. very important uh, to work your foot intrinsics. Try picking things up on the carpet. Just try squeezing those toes into a ball. They need to be exercised as well. Yeah, nice plug for zero shoes. I had Stephen Sashin <laughs> on my show. He's the founder, and uh, he was an interesting guest with a lot of uh, promotions of, you know, getting uh, the, the bare feet uh, back involved and the way his shoe design is with that wider toe box allows your toes the freedom to, to actually perform. And I love those shoes. They're fantastic. I've also been a big fan of Ibrams for a long time, but I think that's yeah. an important point that you make that this is a gradual uh, and sensible integration of more time 
in barefoot or minimalist shoes. And your feet are very sensitive because we've had them in casts our entire life um, versus uh, some hunter gatherer who's got really strong feet. And, uh, you know, the Vibram represents a step up from a lifetime of barefoot. And so we have to be very, very careful as we integrate these, uh, these times where we're uh, minimizing our shoe function. And I, I tell people, first thing is just walk around the home barefoot and just get some time on your bare feet and get the arches going and absorbing load again. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm constantly teetering on that edge where I'm inviting more calf soreness and foot pain because I insist on doing my sprint workouts and Vibrams or bare feet. And it's taken, uh, it's, it's taken about 14 years of progression and integration when I first put on my first pair of Vibrams in 2006. And so, you know, now I can go on a long hike or a five mile run or whatever, a, a sprint workout wearing the, um, the minimalist shoes, but, um, it's, it's a, um, it's a gentle road that you want to go and, and err on the side of conservatism. Agreed. Uh, but you know, for you and I, we've been doing this for 30 years to our feet. So, you know, we came about, we came upon this a little too late and, and you know some of the damage is already done so uh, you know luckily my feet are sore when i work you know when i first wake up it's funny i mean if you saw mm. me wake wake up in the morning you can't imagine that i would be running in 10 minutes because <laughs> i can't move you know everything hurts even feet, you back. huh okay i feel better Absolutely. doctor because <laughs> i used to for many years especially when i was doing the crazy training as a triathlete my first act in the morning was to get out of bed and hop on one foot out the door and into my spa in the backyard and stick my left foot in there and start doing range of motion and, and getting the jets on it because I could I could not put weight on my foot until I had this water therapy. And it was it was sort of pathetic when you look back and think. And then of course right. I would go lace up and run 12 miles in the canyon and, and go about right. my you know training day as an elite athlete. But um, when you're talking about pursuing general health goals and a guy who can't walk in the morning, something <laughs> is off there with the whole training pattern. And um, yeah, so I, I'm join the club everybody. But if you, if you work on those mobility drills and uh, fascial conditioning and um, things that you, we've heard about on the show a little bit, you can make incremental progress to the point where you're waking up in the morning and it's not so bad. It's not ridiculous. You can actually walk with a stride down the hall. Absolutely. You know, it, it takes a minute, but things will get going. And there's actually, you know, a chemical reason for it. There's a biological reason for it. When, you know, if we image our joints, if I get a 3T MRI of your knees or feet and look at the cartilage and find detail, we're, we're going to find changes there. A radiologist might call them arthritic or degenerative. I hate those words. They're age appropriate. Our cartilage doesn't look the same as it did when we were 16 or 18, right? And what's what we find in uh, degenerative or age appropriate knees or joints is higher levels of inflammatory mediators like interleukin-6, etc. So joints don't like not moving hmm. um, as much as they don't like moving too much. So we wake up and they've been somewhat still all night. So our interleukin six levels, our comp levels, which is a sign of, of cartilage degradation, th those levels are higher. Once we start moving in interleukin 10, which are anti-inflammatory, uh, start rising. That's why our joints start to feel better. Comp levels start to decrease. That's why our joints start to feel better. So there's a biological reason why a lot of us feel this way. And it's not, it doesn't mean you're gonna fall apart. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be crippled uh, as you get older. All right, good to know. So you're just working with your in inflammatory agents and movement being the best formula, the best medicine, uh, better than popping an ibuprofen, just get up and walk Absolutely. around. Correct. I love it. Is that the same for something like, um, back pain that that's kicking in or, or other joint pain, knee pain, where you're, you're getting up from a seated position and um, you experience that the, the discomfort that's worsened from a, a different time on the clock of the day? Could be, absolutely. Um, you know, I have one of the world's worst looking x-ray, back x-rays on uh, x-ray. Um, 
I played, you know, elite level tennis when I was young. It was every day, you know, two hours training, and it turns out that's not so good for a maturing spine. Um, my even my friends who are spine surgeons like, don't lift, don't work out, you're gonna kill mm. yourself. Mm. If I don't do my deadlifts, I feel pain. If I mm. do do them, I feel better. Um, you know, as I said earlier, don't treat an X-ray, treat a person. Uh, don't, yeah, I have a great post on my website. Uh, it says you don't need to know the specifics of your joint pain. It's okay not to know. Um, cause a lot of times these aches, pains, and little niggles are just going to go away. Um, hmm. you start to MRI things that imprints that MRI finding on the back of your brain. Hmm. Uh, no, no one our age has a normal MRI of anything. <sighs> So you're going to blame every pain on something that you saw in an MRI report. You're going to think that every step is making it worse. You're going to change your exercise habits. You're going to change your workout habits. You're going to think that you're protecting your knees by not working out anymore. Mm. But humans die of predictable causes, right? We die of heart disease. We die of stroke, dementia, diabetes, on and on. All of those are prevented or mitigated by exercise. So my point being... You start diving too deep. You start going to doctors and asking for MRIs, demanding MRIs. Uh, you're going to find things that are going to affect your psyche. So don't ask for it unless it's absolutely necessary. Oh, my gosh. That's heavy, doctor. I love it. I, I just spoke with uh, <laughs> Dr. Bruce Lipton, author of Biology Belief, a best-selling book about how your thoughts manifest your cellular function at all times. And, um, you know, it's a lot of people think it is uh, the woo-woo category and the spirituality mixing in with science, but he makes an excellent point. And, and we have this, you know, backed by research in, in quantum physics and medicine that um, the cells can only be in a, a state of uh, growth or protection. And protection represents the, the stress and the worry and the things that we manufacture, the chemicals we manufacture with our thoughts and sending stress hormones into the bloodstream. And that totally lines up with what you're saying, where if you go looking hard enough for an excuse or something to complain about or blame, you are going to manifest that as a, a bad knee. And then in contrast, the, the physical therapy uh, people that I that I really love. There's, there's Rod Shorey in Los Angeles and there's PT Revolution in Lake Tahoe. And I had this uh, horrible uh, knee injury that I couldn't run or jump for six months. And I was, I thought I was facing surgery and I finally went in to get the proper care and um, they were working around the pain. So I was doing all kinds of stuff that did not aggravate the injury that did not invite additional pain, but now I'm getting my, my glutes and my quads and things that had atrophied stronger and stronger, and then getting the hands-on manipulation, you know, a different treatment than a knife and a scalpel. And yep. sure enough, the pain subsided really quickly because I was now attacking, uh, you know, the, the, the actual root cause to, to take care of the symptom rather than just fixate on, hey, my body's not perfect and I'm in big trouble. Right. You know, there are times when I tell people in my office, stop going to doctors. You know, they're there for the <laughs> Dr. Luck says, their... stop going to doctors. <laughs> oh, mercy. This guy is not right. going to be welcome at the next conference. I'm already, I'm already disinvited. But, you know, they've been to three experts, four experts. They've mm. had three different MRIs. You know, they're unsure exactly what's hurting them. But it's clear there's no obvious structural defect. You know, there are age appropriate changes. There may be a small meniscus tear. It doesn't need an operation. Just start exercising, gain back that confidence, start slowly and go. And you know what? A lot of these people come back three or four years later when something else hurts and says, you know what? <laughs> you told me to stop seeing doctors, to just go at this slowly, to take the time that it's going to need. And look, you know, I was fine and I got back. It's, it's, it's such a critical message. You know, we have things so wrong in medicine sometimes. I mean, how many times have you gone to a doctor with pain and, and you're told, come back in two weeks, if it still hurts, then we'll do this, right? Um, what feels better at our age in two weeks? Nothing. <laughs> Right. We're, we're, we're counting, we're counting down the wrong direction. It ain't, it ain't going to be any better. This is as good as it gets said Jack Nicholson in the movie. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, we, we have to go slow, um, whatever. 
Okay, so we'll be good if left to our own desires. Uh, left if we allow our biology to work, we gain the confidence, uh, and we don't have any obvious structural abnormalities. Okay, then what's your practice like? Are you doing a lot of chit chatting on the couch and, and getting people psyched up to go to go work out, or are, are some people eventually ending up with um, you know uh, inter invasive medical treatment? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, Listen, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I operate. Um, there are people who do need surgery. There are people who slip off a roof or whatever, fall on a rock and tear things. There are runners our age who, you know, can't run because of arthritis, you know, that's localized to one side of the knee or the other. There are procedures short of a knee replacement that we can do and we can restore that runner's longevity by allowing them to return to running with an osteotomy or another com complex procedure. And I really thrive in that complex environment. And uh, that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, so my favorite patients are 40, 50, 60s. Uh, they used to be a triathlete. They used to be a runner. They've been told they can never do it again. Mm. That's a challenge that I'll accept any day. Right. And then you're going to work hand in hand with that person to say, look, we're going to go in and fix this. And then your job is to go and do uh, your, your PT exercises as prescribed for the next six months so we can come out and, and uh, serve for the match again someday in the future. Absolutely. Listen, I, I, you know, I'll, 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 I'll see 10, 12 tries or runners a week with meniscus tears for second and third opinions. <sighs> uh, I'm like, just stop. Just do your therapy, commit to it, and you're going to be fine. 95% um, of the time, you're not going to need, 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 need an operation. A lot of times an operation can make things worse. You know, our joints don't like to be invaded, um, yeah, especially if that meniscus is not going to be fixed. Um, so wow. people, once they understand that it's going to take a few months, do the physical therapy and you're going to do fine. Uh, a lot of them are good. Some of them may choose to have the surgery. Uh, they don't get better immediately and they get better a few months later. Why did they get better? Because they didn't do the therapy well before the surgery. They'd had the surgery. So now they commit to the therapy. Oh my gosh. That's, right? Hey, so, whatever works, so. but let, let's think of a different option, huh? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's funny. But it, it does make sense. Like once you're, once you're going in for the big deal, uh, it committed. kind of puts a, a different category in your brain. Um, listeners, I should share when I was, uh, 39, I had a spontaneous tear of the meniscus walking down the street with my old dog. And all of a sudden my knee swelled up and I, I was, I had to limp back home and I couldn't believe it. Cause I'd done nothing to, to invite this. And I was Googling and I found this article that said males around age 40 often experience a spontaneous tear of the meniscus with no known attribution. And I'm like, wait, I'm only 39. This is crap. But I, it was so minor that I refused to consider the prospect of surgery. I could walk and bicycle without pain, but I couldn't run a step for what turned out to be nine months. But I rehabbed that thing like crazy. I got my muscles so strong and eventually everything vanished with no intervention, but it took, it took much longer than the people you hear about where they're, they're back running five miles two weeks after their meniscus surgery. But I contend that you know in the long term, when you're going in and, and cutting things out, um, you, you're probably going to have repercussions that, uh, you know, pick up a decade or, or more later. They absolutely will. And, you know, you're making the assumption that that meniscus tore at that moment, uh, that may not even be, be the case, right? How, what percent of active 50 year olds have a meniscus tear in their knee and don't know it. So we take 150 year olds, we give them a hundred dollars to volunteer in a study lay down in the machine, uh, upwards of 20% of them are going to have a meniscus abnormality. No way. 100%. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, and a lot are going to have the same in their rotator cuff. 80% mm. are going to have a disc abnormality in, in their back. These are people who have no pain. So you go to a doctor's office. That's why I was saying sometimes you don't want to know exactly why your knee is hurting you. Sometimes it's okay that the doctor examines you. They find out, look, you, you're not complaining of this, that, and this. Your exam is normal. You're going to feel better in a few months. Let's do some therapy. Don't necessarily push for that MRI because you're going to see things 
you know, if you see a meniscus tear, you don't know that that started the other day when your pain started. It could have been there for years or months. Um, and that may not be the source of your pain. MRIs don't show us pain. MRIs show us structures. Mm. And those structures, much like our hair, our eyes, and everything else, change as we get older. So a lot of them are age-appropriate changes. Um, so the less we're imaged, sometimes the better off we are. And I had the same incident that, that you did. I came off a trail. I don't remember an injury. I got into my car at the trailhead. I got home an hour later. Um, my knee was swollen. <laughs> I had no idea why. Um, waited a month. Swelling was still there. I was able to run, but it was hard. Uh, mm. I was able to work out, but I couldn't go deep, etc. cetera. Um, and I kept working out and I kept running, but I didn't push it. Uh, two months later, I'm like, geez. Uh, I talked to a friend. He's like, come on, we'll get an MRI. Like, okay, fine. Get an MRI. There's a meniscus tear. There's a cartilagist. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. And sure enough, three months, all gone. Back on the trail. No swelling. Never came back. Go figure what did you so do to rehab nine it? months yeah. i rehabbed it i i you know i spoke to friends uh, great therapists in my area they helped me i did my own workouts and runs and it just went away that's why i was saying nothing's going to get better in two weeks at our age uh, just wait. um you know i'm reading these stats about the increasing prevalence of joint replacements in the hip yeah. and the knee particularly and i'm wondering if um some of these concepts would apply to those, everyone I've talked to that had a hip replacement or was considering it, um, you know, reports that there's no use, uh, it's bone on bone, it's, it's beyond, uh, you know, uh, beyond uh, uh, repair. And um, so I'm going in for the, 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 the titanium. And um, it seems, seems kind of uh, scary that uh, the 400% the increase uh, that we're seeing in recent years. I wonder what you think about, about those joint replacements. I did a great podcast with, with David Hunter, uh, who's an arthritis researcher, one of the tops in the world out of Australia. Um, and that was the entire focus of the podcast. Um, we, as, I, as we talked about earlier, you don't treat x-rays, you treat people because you can, I can see the same x-ray and 10 different people in the same day and I'm gonna get 10 different it, it, it issues and 10 different complaints. So you can have bone on bone in room one and they have some ache and discomfort and some swelling when they finish a 10 mile run. <laughs> the woman, the person in room two can't walk. The person mm -hmm. in room three, yeah, they develop a little swelling in the morning, it's gone by noon. So who needs the knee replacement? You know, you don't, don't do it because you have bone on bone. Um, there's no surgery without risk. The only surgery without risk is a surgery on somebody else, um, especially <laughs> when you're talking about a joint replacement, right? You're taking very substantial risks. One, uh -huh. uh, it may not meet your expectations, right? You may be expecting a joint that you had when you were 18, you're gonna run, you're gonna play tennis. You see the ads on TV, people are you know, snowboarding, skiing. They, you may not be able to, you might, who knows, but you're taking a risk. You get an infected joint, joint replacement, you need to have that joint removed. You need six weeks of antibiotics, and then you need another one put back in. And that reimplantation, the third time, uh, has a 20% risk of reinfection. Um, blood clots, uh, on and on and on. So joint replacements have been wonderful, just mm. wonderful at restoring movement and the ability to walk and participate in life in those who need it. Mm. If you're getting it because you can't run four miles anymore, you can only do two, you can't play three sets, you have to stop at one, it's probably not the right indication, hmm. right? But if done for the right reason and the right person, they're a wonderful procedure. Right. I guess you would want to exhaust all possibilities with this aggressive uh, rehabilitation regimen and, and strengthening regimen. And then, uh, you know, there's probably a point where uh, especially an athletic minded person, which most of the people I know uh, were, were going in for the surgery so they could, you know, hit some extreme goals coming out of there that they used to do. And so that's, a, that seems like a good candidate, an athletic person that's going to take it and run with it afterward. 
Yeah, really important. If you're considering a joint replacement as an athletic person out there, you better make sure you have a long and hard discussion with your surgeon about what your goals are and allow the surgeon to discuss with you what the realistic goals of the procedure are. And you better <laughs> make sure those they're the up. same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If they're not, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Uh, but but you're right. We, physical yeah. therapy is a high value treatment mm. option for, for osteoarthritis. There's no doubt because again, we're not treating an image. We're treating a person. And there are plenty of people out there with bone on bone, hip arthritis, bone on bone, knee arthritis, and they're doing fine. And there are others who are crippled. So mm. the crippled ones are the ones who need the surgery. Mm. Uh, before we, before we go, I want to talk about the, the other end of the continuum that you mentioned in your uh, discussions about maintaining muscle mass. So we have this critical objective. Uh, we're fired up. We're going to go we put our body under resistance load, maintain that muscle mass. And on the flip side, if we don't, we have this insidious accumulation of visceral fat, which causes so many health problems. Um, it seems to be most frequently talked about uh, on the male side where you're getting that beer belly as you age and it's getting bigger and bigger. So let's talk about what that represents and the, the stark contrast between someone who's able to stave off that visceral fat and maintain muscle versus letting that slippery slope, uh, you know, commence. Yeah. So <clears throat> as we alluded to before, we die of very predictable causes heart disease, dementia, type 2 diabetes. These, these are, at their core, metabolic diseases, which if you drill down to the root cause of metabolic diseases is a defect in the mitochondria, right? We have poor mitochondrial flexibility. So your mitochondria have a lot of difficulty in burning fat. They instead prefer to burn glucose, which you don't want. Um, and we have a lower number of mitochondria. We have less muscle mass. So we have less mitochondria as a whole. Um, and so in fixing, uh, it, eliminating the risk of developing a metabolic disease, such as fatty liver, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, or uh, mitigating the downstream effects of uh, the uh, longstanding metabolic diseases, we need to achieve metabolic health and resistance exercise is one of the critical ways of doing this because as you increase your muscle mass, you increase the number of mitochondria as you improve the aerobic respiration, either with zone two exercise with moderate resistance training, you're increasing and improving your metabolic flexibility or how your mitochondria work. You're allowing them to burn fat as opposed to glucose. Uh, you're encouraging fat mobilization. You're improving the ability of your muscle cells to burn triglycerides. Um, so these all contribute to improving your metabolic health. Now, the answer is not just resistance training and not just muscle mass. You need some aerobic work in there too. And that's the magic of zone two or low heart rate training. Um, but all of these two work in conjunction to improve your metabolic health by improving your mitochondrial function. Well said. I think that's a, a beautiful finish. We got to go out there and keep our aerobic conditioning, keep moving around, especially when you say zone two, if the listeners aren't familiar with that, that's the very comfortably paced Aero predominantly aerobic, predominantly fat burning. And I think uh, something you said earlier when I asked you about balancing your uh, endurance goals with your strength training and your longevity goals, uh, that seems to be the key where uh, the, the negative aspects of the endurance training come when you exceed that zone two, when you exceed that aerobic heart rate and start to embark upon these workouts that are uh, slightly too significantly too stressful. And that's your day after day pattern. That's when you see the, the AFib and the, the problems coming up. Yeah, absolutely. Most runners, uh, if they're not trained, uh, they run too hard or too fast on their slow days and too slow on their hard days. <laughs> so it's okay to do an anaerobic threshold day. It's mm. okay to do, you know, a VO2 max workout, but it should be, your training should be 80-20 in most circumstances, right? 80% simple or e easier zone two, 
or zone one even, and uh, 20% higher. If that works for, for Kipchoge and others, it can work for us. Yeah. Right, and everything's relative. So when Kipchoge is running uh, five yeah. minute, 30 second yeah. miles at high altitude, and that's a zone one, maybe a little zone two, you know, very, very easy for the average person, that means a brisk walk. And that's the part that a lot of endurance athletes aren't getting where, well, I'm gonna go for an easy day today. And so I'm gonna go uh, four miles at uh, 9.30 pace. And that's not a brisk walk. Uh, and it, it's, it's harder than Kipchoge's easy day. And that's kind of mind blowing, but it is what it is in terms of the relative, uh, you know, you're, you're measuring the um, percentage of uh, maximum heart rate. And so yeah, we're comparing apples correct. to apples, yeah. You're absolutely correct. A zone two workout of an elite athlete would, would kill me you know, <laughs> you know, if I tried to match, you know, their, their pace and distance, right? Uh, your zone two is unique to you. Um, and you have to find out what, what, what it is and you have to s stay under it. You know, we both go out with a lot of runners and as soon as they start their heart rate is 150. Yeah. You know, they bl blow right through zone, zone one, two, three, and they're up at low zone four immediately. That's because they haven't built their aerobic base. It's an investment that will pay off. But zone two running is hard. It's annoying as hell. Um, and it takes a long time to show benefits, unlike our anaerobic training, where mm. we see the benefits fast. So mm -hmm. that's a lot sexier. Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, setting it straight. And that's the reason it's so alluring. And we get that instant gratification of busting out an impressive workout and getting a sweat going and high fiving our training partner. But we right. do have to look down at our our ultimate goals. It's like overdoing it in the gym or doing too many CrossFit sessions in a week. Um, you went from a great fitness stimulation to something that's now put you into a high risk category. Correct. All right, Dr. Howard Lux, that was fun. Thank you for joining us. Right. Good stuff. Thank you, time. listeners. Another great show. And we can go look at uh, your great articles and commentary on howardluxmd.com and anywhere else we want to uh, send people. Twitter, H.J. Lux, L-U-K-S. H.J. Lux, L-U-K-S on Twitter. Go, go tweet away with him when you're, when you're done doing your, <laughs> your resistance training workout. Thanks, everybody. Da-da-da-da.